answering all of the hard questions. Oh uh, wait, maybe that's Steve, I don't know. Uh, and then of course we have Steve Krug, our technical director. I think that's something Krug, I think that's a first. Oh, 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 oh my god. Woo! So yeah, when I first heard about these guys, I thought 
like the word crazy, you know, because I was just <laughs> going there. You know, uh, I had really just a couple of friends uh, helping me out, and you guys like really big, you know. And uh, coming from an MMO, uh, it's probably the most difficult kind of game you could build. So I, I, I thought, well, I'm in deep trouble, you know, because these guys want to use this technology, and they want to play it probably the most difficult thing you can ever do in a game. So I, I say, well, uh, so they say yes to everything, you know, and they take all, they should take all the grade because they, they were really they, they took a huge gamble on us. <laughs> all right, thanks, uh, John. So, what were the things about Box Farm that uh, made us choose it at the time? I mean, we discovered many advantages since then, but the main issues were um, it allowed us to represent a lot more shapes um, since it was much more freeform the way the voxels were represented as opposed to the fixed shapes that we had in our old engine. It was much more flexible. Um, had a much longer draw distance. Uh, you know, as I said, in our old engine, we could only display display out for a few under 100 voxels or so. Uh, whereas now we've got these uh, mountainscapes, and, and as you can see, you know, great. Uh, as you all know, you're players, so a beautiful distance uh, capabilities. Uh, and then, lastly, he had a whole procedural generation system in place so that we could save on data costs. In our original engine, every single little hill and valley, you have to save that on disk or transmit it across the network to you guys. Now that doesn't have to happen because it's all generated procedurally on each client, uh, except for the stuff that you change, which is you know, plenty of data there, but <laughs> you, want, you want to have that vote. So how does all this stuff work? Well, um, the Vox system in Vox Farm uses something called dual lines of contouring. We're going to go kind of 20,000 foot view about how dual lines of contouring works, uh, at least in practical <coughs> sense for how you guys are going to use it. So basically, um, this has been described before in other documents that like Dave version published and uh, in many of the videos. So these concepts aren't new, but I just wanted to go over it because it's important how the whole system works. Uh, basically, every voxel has a material texture, color, uh, and it has an internal point that represents uh, where inside of that voxel uh, the mesh that is generated, which is what you actually see is what video cards can, can display. It's what's called a mesh, it's made of primer. It's the point in that, in that voxel that the mesh goes through. Um, so what happens is if, if we're going to build that mesh, it uh, looks at all of the neighboring voxels and tries to find places where there is a junction between air and non-air. And at that point, it creates a triangle, actually a quad in this case, two triangles, out of the points on all those neighboring voxels that are on that board. It's actually pretty, pretty simple. It's just a lot of work. So the processor has to work really hard to do this. Uh, that leads to all kinds of interesting things, uh, like micro voxels, something the player discovered. Uh, I've got the same, I've got Jeff's disease. I'm getting to click forward. <laughs> uh, Microvoxels are actually really simple. Um, every box can have only a single internal point in it, but what a microvoxel is, is when the points are very close to their neighbor points. What that means is you can represent a very thin line, however, you can't represent two thin lines in the same voxel. So, and the cool thing was is that you guys kind of discovered this, and the last time it was a way of making really interesting new things that our tools didn't really allow you to do very easily. It wasn't that the system didn't support microvoxels, it was more that our tools didn't really allow you to do it easily. But you guys found ways around that, which was awesome. You guys explored us every day, we were seeing new stuff that came out early on. Still do. So, one of the important issues with uh, any box system, but certainly uh, also in dual contouring, is right. constant aliasing. And what we call aliasing, that something last picture went right. The shape that you're trying to build. That one's right. Drawing, the one before went right. right. Uh, you can't, uh, let's say every single point is represented by an arrow. So you see the, the black arrows that are uh, coming from the corner of each box. Thank you. Um, the upper right box of this drawing has two points in it. Well, you can't do that uh, because the box can only internally store one point. So you end up with a shape that you can't represent with the boxes in this case. So that was a, a, a fairly limiting uh, early on implementation of the system. But later, 
couple months ago, released something called Roaming Vectors. This is a fantastic idea that uh, Miguel and his crew came up with, which is where, um, as you see here in this drawing, uh, you can borrow the internal point from a neighboring voxel. So in this case, the upper middle voxel has two points in it, because he's borrowing, represented by the green arrow, the internal point from the voxel in the upper right. Um, now, some of the tools that are uh, using this right now are, for example, when you play shape blocks, you're replacing things that are using roaming vectors to allow the greater resolution. These two that are shape blocks, especially like some of the chamfer corners and pieces, couldn't represent them most of the time because they, they had too, too high frequency of detail, which means they had too many points to them. But now with roaming uh, vectors, those come out perfectly. Um, the, other, the other tool that makes heavy use of that right now is the uh, the line tool. Um, we made those in that same patch that we put up the roaming vectors. The line tool became much more accurate. Certainly has some, still can make some interesting shapes, but we're going to be working on that in the future too, but um, much more accurate. And we're going to have other systems that come online here soon that will also be using uh, roaming vectors. Alright, so let's talk about how the contrary works. Um, one of the things that players, I suspect, don't realize is one of the major technical hurdles to think about this game. Most games these days are heavily pre-calculated. So if you have a level in a game like you know, Mass Effect or something, all of those meshes, all the triangles in those meshes, and the textures that are applied to those triangles, they're all pre-calculated to be as optimal as possible. I mean, they have to run on consoles, which have much more limited resources than PCs. Uh, so all that pre-calculation is something that we don't have the luxury of because everything can change on the fly. We can destroy things on the fly, we can build things on the fly. So um, how you display things in the, in the world in a dynamic environment becomes an interesting challenge. So one of those challenges is how do you apply textures to all these triangles in the world. Uh, other games do it in a, in a tool like Maya, you know, the artists go in and they, they build those textures very specifically and optimally. Well, in, in a, in the dynamic world, we use something called tripointer texture. This is a really interesting approach to apply texture to arbitrary shapes. So what you do is you take that texture and on three different axes, you apply it and blend it with its neighbors. So for example, here in the sphere, you see the three textures and it, they get wrapped around like this. Um, it avoids problems that uh, earlier attempts at doing this have where you just do a top-down view, so we're basically just having a top texture. And the problem with that system is that you get, um, like on the side of a steep hill, you'll get really stretched textures, and it looks really terrible. So one of the interesting things to be aware of with right kind of texture, you know, you guys have probably seen it, in fact, this screenshot was supposed to be from a player asking me what this was, so I actually included this section in this, in this panel. Um, you can get ghosting. So notice that the, uh, in the middle of the, of the you see how that's just two images of the, the brick texture. You know, it was recently um, that posted. Is the texture. Mm -hmm. You've got you know, a texture here and a texture on the other plane. They're, they're both sort of competing, and the, the engine can't know which one Jim and Martha posted that. blends more than the other. Ah. That was something you could do to try and enhance it, but really just being aware of it as a builder, you can kind of avoid those things. <laughs> All right, so how do we go about representing a, an entire continent or island worth of, of, of data without just crippling? Points. Now, I mean, certainly the points have some authorization to go, but there's a lot of data in those worlds, big bytes of data. So we use what's called a clip map. Um, now, what is a clip map? A clip map is a structure that says, where I'm standing, I'm, I want to include all of the really high detail information. So you see in this drawing, the red dot is where you can stand. And all those little, little squares around it represent what we call what we call cells. And each cell is about 40 by 40 by 40 boxes. 